So, so, what do they do up to now? We basically consider a couple of different ways to build the learning algorithm. One, very general, empirical risk minimization. Here is ERM, although it's not super precise, perhaps it is better be called penalized empiric minimization. Empiric minimization is kind of the common name for techniques that are based on the idea of minimizing the error, possibly subject to constraint and penalization, okay? We often call this regularization, penalized regularization. Uh, and we've seen that uh, um, we discuss mostly the um, computational aspect of these kind of problems, least squares, logistic, SDM. And we saw that somewhat this kind of approach um, defer computational consideration to a second step. You first take a, you know, a modular uh, statistician, uh, signal processing, whatever you want to call it, hat, in which you design an empirical objective function. And then you take that hat off, you take your numeric person hat on, and you discuss how to solve this with, say, GD, SGD. And you keep on going, Newton, suck them this and that, you average it, a bunch of stuff, okay? All right, so this is one thing we did. But then we saw that one can actually somewhat skip the first line, jump to a second line, consider something like this. Let me call it like this. Regularization by optimization, we call it implicit regularization. We saw iterative regularization is a classic name. And uh, here it is just, a, it is just a, an intuitive idea. In this case, I, I wrote here GD. Sasha mentioned SGD. The idea is that rather than having first an empirical objective and then with some constraint, and then uh, and so the way you take care of the stability and putting a bias on your problem, and then optimization. Here, there is just one step. It's optimization that itself that takes into account. Thanks a lot, man. Thanks. Two high security. I bought some very nice markers. Now I'm dependent. So in this case, there is not. I mean, the, the two. There is no separation between designing an empirical objective and then solving the optimization problem. It's the optimization procedure itself that induces a bias and possibly control the stability of the estimator. Again, as Sasha introduced uh, um, at the end of his uh, lecture, uh, the stochastic gradient approach. Yes, the, um, last week we discussed quite a bit the idea of using gradient descent itself. And we saw how this opens somewhat another box. This is a big box, and it's a classical statistics box. This opens another box, which is an interface between optimization and statistics a bit more. Okay? What do we want to do today? We want to start from the observation is that in all these methods, a certain number of matrices needs to be handled. Okay? We saw this one, we saw this one, and we saw this one. Okay? So this is ND. This is D, D, and this is N, N. And we saw that this is the guy that gives rise to kernel methods if you replace the inner product with some kernel or feature map kernel. And this the idea is that in all these algorithms, one way or another, you have to handle these kind of matrices, OK? And we are interested specifically to ask what happens when n and d are both extremely large. We're not going to make a distinction when one is much larger than the other. We want to look at a situation where they're both extremely large. 
if this is uh, like what happens in many today of, of today's application, okay? And the question is, how can you somewhat scale up the technique we have seen so far? <coughs> the bottom line is that you know memory becomes a real concern. Here, we saw that uh, we we gain the idea that we somewhat have one parameter, time, training time, controlling at the same time the stability of your solution and its uh, um, time complexity. Here we ask the question about uh, memory complexity, space complexity. Can we somewhat reduce the space complexity of the problem? How can we do that? Okay. So what we want to discuss today is, uh, <coughs> broadly speaking, that you're introducing projections. And we're going to consider projection broadly here essentially as a way to do, if you want another word, dimensional reduction. Okay? Well, you have a big matrix and you would like to reduce its size. And we're going to revisit the three main ideas. The first one is classic, it's PCA. This is going to mostly warm up. I'm assuming that most of you know what's PCA. We're going to take it as an excuse to see how somewhat PCA is special and also how can you generalize it using kernels because it takes again one line. But then we're going to discuss sketching. which is the somewhat general idea that gives the name to this class. And then we're going to discuss what you might call a nice strong slash subsampling methods. Which again, you, you can see is just a, a somewhat a variation of the theme of, uh, of uh, doing some kind of sketching, but it somewhat can be introduced from a slightly different perspective. Okay? Um, Let's see. What is that you want to do? We want to discuss again, um, essentially, some kind of dimensional light reduction. So the first thing is you have the data matrix, OK? And now you want to apply to this data matrix some other matrix. Let me call it S for sketch. The idea is that this matrix should be V times M. And we're going to think of the situation where both N and D are, are similar and large, okay? And we want to look at the situation where we can pick M uh, smaller, ideally much smaller than, uh, than um, both these guys. Now, what does it mean large? Well, Roughly speaking, if you, if you consider any of these matrix, okay, just consider any of them because we're assuming that N and D are roughly the same size. If you just now assume that uh, you have double precision for each of the numbers of, uh, of the entry of the matrix, and you do a quick back of the envelope computation, you basically see that on a normal laptop, you can go up to 10,000, 40,000 maybe. Um, 40,000, I think, is already too much. Say a maximum 10,000 um, is that... Uh, is that a hint on uh, the size of uh, who's the guy with the binocle? Can, maybe I can fix it for you. What do you want to see? I can zoom in. I'm a zoom uh, device. I can all see the best one. This one. I feel particularly guilty when somebody starts using. How about down? Nystrom. Subsampling is too long to write, so I'm not going to write it. I just call it Nystrom. <laughs> All right? All right, that was a subtle, that was a very subtle uh, suggestion that something was too small. Uh, All right, we want this guy. We want to think about that. And we're saying, uh, you know, if, if you have to store each of the numbers here in double precision, you see that, you know, a normal laptop with a few gigs of memory, maybe 10,000 uh, is how much you can push it. Um, okay, now you can say, okay, now I'm gonna spend a lot of money to buy a lot of memory, but it, it doesn't scale up that much, okay? So you can probably go up to a few uh, tens of thousands and then you're done, okay? So you don't go up to a million point, not even close. Then you can say, okay, but you know, I've seen stochastic gradient, maybe I can process data one at a time. Sure, but really you don't wanna just process the data reading this one at a time. 
So you're gonna do that thing in batches, then how big are the batches? Well, tens of thousands, okay? So this gives you a feeling how far you can go when you keep on uploading things in memory. And the question here really is, okay, but do I really have to process all of this or I can just do some quick computation first, kill a few dimensions, and then process things again? So that's what we're doing here. So when we say large, we're thinking of situation where these matrices are typically too big to be uh, uploaded in memory, and you have to somewhat, at best, start to reading chunks of them, and you ask yourself if you can reduce the dimension of the problem somehow, okay? So the question we wanna ask is, okay, it's fairly obvious, this is a basic thing, it's just a linear dimensionality reduction technique. You go from dimension D to dimension M. How are you gonna choose S, and what are the properties of these different matrices, okay? Well, the first example is PCA. PCA is probably the most popular way, so we're gonna just revisit a little bit. Oh, notice that I'm not uh, writing it now, but once you have this, then you can just try to do the same learning uh, approaches we've seen before on the projected data. You just replace the original data set with the new projected data. So let's think a second about how um, we can project data. So PCA, if you give me matrix X, which is the original matrix, corresponds to a decomposition of this form, okay? Where U and V are orthogonal matrices. They are respectively, uh, the rows of this are a basis in Rn. The uh, columns of this are um, bases in uh, um, Rd. And then uh, these are the singular values, okay? And here R stands for the rank, which, you know, without loss of generative, just means it's like either N or D. Doesn't really matter for our discussion, okay? Um, okay, so, what we want to do, we want to use uh, uh, exactly a piece of PCA or a, a, this kind of structure to actually define a matrix. Oh, sorry, there are too many S, I realize now in this game. So I need to call this differently. How shall we call it? Maybe you could call the other one, keep that S and the other one. I'm gonna call this one C. <laughs> <laughs> Sigma I don't like, it's a covariance, then my brain gets so confused. I'm gonna call this capital gamma, okay? No, it's too ugly, Sigma. What do you want, Sasha? Tell me what I have to use, because Sigma. A statistician tells me to use Sigma, which is the covariance, and I go for it. All right. I mean, you can write the SVD in a bunch of different ways, okay? You can write it, uh, this is, uh, what, what you call it, reduced form or something. So you can make these N by N, okay? So these are, oh, sorry, because I mixed up. So you can make these N by N, and then these matrix is gonna become diagonal up to a point, and then a bunch of zeros, and these are gonna make this D by D, or you can just not squeeze it in. And I made a mistake. The columns of this are the bases, and the rows of this are the bases, okay? It's the same thing. So if you, this is somewhat a more compact form, uh, it doesn't really matter, okay? And, but they're not orthogonal matrices, no? Orthogonal matrices are squares. All right, so, I do it like you like it. Now and then, and then, well, first we do like this, we do like this. So these are a set of orthogonal vectors. All the vectors in here are orthogonal vectors and they are an orthonormal basis for R to the R, which is somewhat the span of uh, the rows of this matrix, okay? So you can write SVD in a bunch of ways. This is somewhat the compact form. In this case, these two matrices are not orthogonal matrices, but are a set of orthogonal vectors, okay? That form an orthonormal basis in Rn, a subspace of Rn, or a subspace of Rd. For our discussion, this really won't matter, so um, I'm gonna keep it like this. If you want, the other way of writing this is uh, Xn, let me just use the same notation, but here you can think of these to be n by n, these to be n by d, and these to be d by d, and then what happens is that here, this matrix is gonna be somewhat uh, diagonal up to a point, and then a bunch of zeros, okay? 
but there are two equivalent way of writing things. If you look in Wikipedia enough, you know, after the first line, the second one, you find them both. Okay. For us, it doesn't really matter because let me tell you what we're going to do. What we want to do is just that we know that this forms an orthonormal basis for the columns of our matrix. We want to now select M elements of this orthonormal basis. Which one? The what correspond to the biggest eigenvalue, well, singular values. Okay. So here we assume with a loss of generality because that's what you always do is that this diagonal matrix or or is uh, actually as uh, entries uh, order in decreasing fashion, okay? And then we're going to take the first m eigenvector, uh, singular vectors of this matrix, okay? So we take vm, and we're going to take our s equal to vm, okay? What is vm? Again, is m of the singular vectors the, of the matrix x hat, okay? And we're gonna just use them, okay? So according to this choice, now we're gonna have that our x m hat is just gonna be, okay? So this matrix is D by m. I take m singular vectors. Sounds good? All right, fair enough. We're going to use them, but let me just uh, uh, remind you a couple of things. The first thing is, uh, is uh, again, it, it takes uh, 10 minutes to, to do uh, kernel version of this so we're going to do it because it literally takes 10 minutes maximum and it basically the idea that if you have this you can actually rewrite this in a bunch of ways so you can go from the original matrix to its transpose okay but then if you want what you can do is you can now multiply on the right by u and then take sigma to the minus one and so you're going to get X transpose U sigma to the minus one V. Okay. Okay. Why do we care about this? Because once you have this, you can now write the matrix V in terms of uh, the matrix U and the singular vector, the singular values, okay? In particular now, if you want, you can replace Vm here with this expression. So, this is the equation we wanna use, okay? This holds for any set of vectors, in particular the M, and so what I wanna do now is replace it here. Is that okay? Can you nod or? Do some like <laughs> no. All right. Now we can make two observations. The first one is that we can just see what is that. You can simplify that equation a little bit, right? Remember that yet another way, you know, because we have this and we have that, we can also write down x hat, x hat transpose as what? U sigma square to transpose, right? So take that, plug it in there, what you get? Well, there's going to be a UM that sees this U transpose and then I give a bunch of ones and then a bunch of zeros. Some of the eigenvectors are orthogonal, are the same, and some of them are orthogonal. Okay? Then there's going to be this uh, 
this is sigma to the minus 1. Yeah, so this is sigma m to the minus 1. OK? This is going to see a sigma square. OK? So you're going to get. Write it because your face is uh, lost. And that's what I'm saying. You just take it, plug it in there. Okay. I have to see what happens here. These two guys, so I'm going to give you a bunch of one and then some zeros. This guy sees this guy and there is a uh, M. Okay. This guy is going to see this. Okay. And essentially, this is going to just project everything on the first M eigen vector. So you're going to get UM sigma m to the minus 1 sorry to the to the nothing to this okay that's it so said this this simplifies uh, the expression a little bit okay it just showed that basically if you want to take your data and project it all you have to do is to take the first few uh, eigenvectors of the the matrix which is n by n and that's it okay so that's the first observation the second observation is that, what is this? <coughs> Did you ever give a name to this? Is the n by n matrix that contains in each entry, what? The first row of this times the first column of this. Or is the inner product? The Grayman matrix that then we can call the kernel matrix for the linear kernel. So this thing here is the kernel matrix in the linear case. That's it. That's what it is. Okay. So, <coughs> let me rewrite this equation we found in the specific case of kernel. Okay. Sorry, in the specific case of kernel. Let me rewrite this in the for just one singular vector. Okay, not for here I'm writing the equation for so to project all possible data points. Now I want to just project one point. Okay. So I want us to take a vector x, okay, and project it using this V of M. And then it's easy to see that this just corresponds to um, just take the entry J and this is gonna be I just have to rewrite this. Okay, but this is just the, the set of inner product, and what you get is just x <laughs> transpose xi i from one to n one over sigma i, and here you get uh, u. Uh, sorry, this is a j, this is a j, and this <coughs> is a i. Okay, I'm 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 skipping to go from there to there and just rewriting things okay so here i wrote a relationship that holds for the training set okay and i wrote it in matrix form here i write the same exact thing but for one specific vector x not necessarily in the training set and i just take the vector and project it using the m and i just look at the first the jth entries for the sake of simplicity what do i get well this matrix is going to give me a superposition of a bunch of inner products weighted with weights that are going to depend on the specific component, the singular value corresponding to the specific component I'm dealing with, this sigma j. And then there are going to be weights that correspond to the corresponding eigenvector u. Okay? How long is the eigenvector u? Well, it was an eigenvector of the matrix n by n, so it's size n. All right? So again, there's nothing going on here. I just rewrote this for an individual vector. It's just linear algebra. There's no machine learning going on. We don't want to spend a lot of time on this because that's your linear algebra class. But what we want to do is stare at this equation and see why we care about this. But this is the equation we've seen so many times in this class before, right? So this is a case where you basically have that an operation that you want to perform only depends on inner products. And the coefficients here also only depends on inner product because this, again, are the eigenvalues and eigen, if you want, are the square root of the eigenvalues and the eigenvector of the matrix K, which is n by n. So 
Take the linear kernel for now, OK? What you have to do to compute that projection, you can either compute the singular value of the matrix, or what you can do is form the kernel matrix, diagonalize it, and then find sigma j uj. If you want to now project, you're going to compute this thing here. And everything here depends only on inner product. The matrix k depends only on inner product. The guy here depends only on inner product. So you, you're completely uh, work only with inner product. Yeah? Doesn't the SVD depend like, on the projective input? Like when, when you actually compute like u sub m and sigma sub m, like, isn't that actually a function of phi of f? Of oh, phi? Like of the feature map. It's not there yet. OK, so right now I'm just saying you're, we agree that in the linear case, you can either work with SVD, OK, or you can form K and then do this computation. OK, so you can, I'm saying you can take matrix X, do the SVD, and compute this directly. Or you can take kind of a longer path. It doesn't seem to have a reason now, but it will use for when you take feature map, which is don't take the SVD, actually build the matrix X, which is again just x at x at transpose, diagonalize that, and then use this equation rather than that one. OK? You agree? Now we can play the game of replacing data with feature maps and see what happens. OK? But it's going to be surprisingly uninteresting, because in some sense, uh, that's what we've been doing already, and it's going to be very easy. So. We want to take x and replace it with phi of x, <laughs> OK, for some feature map. At some point, we're going to replace feature map with kernels. Well, then you can basically redo the whole story. I'm not going to rewrite everything by saying, OK, instead of x hat, I should now consider <coughs> phi hat, the data matrix after uh, using the feature map. And then I can write everything I wrote on the other board, OK? If the feature map is finite dimensional, I can go and diagonalize this directly. But suppose that now I want to take a feature map which is infinite dimensional that corresponds to kernels. Then I like to rewrite this one here. I can write that. Um, I can compute now. I can send the vector x into a new representation. Where this one I cannot compute anymore, okay? But I can compute this one in general. If you have an infinite dimensional current, you cannot compute anymore. You don't have access to V. But you can now compute this, right? I only have to tell you what is ui and so uj and sigma j, but I already told you. There are the eigenvector of the kernel matrix. Not necessarily the linear kernel, but any kernel matrix. So you give me, now it's a recipe. You want to use kernels to project data, what do you do? You take the kernel matrix, you diagonalize, you take eigenvalues and eigenvectors of the kernel matrix, and then you compute the projection of each point using this. So back to your questions, do you need the feature map? As usual, no. You need it to explain things, but you don't need it to compute things. This is just to derive things. That's it. What are you actually doing in terms of interpretation? You are not now taking the PCA of the data in the data space, but you're taking the PCA, the principal component of the data after you mapped into the feature space. So the principal components are not going to be the direction of maximum variance in the data space, but there's going to be some maximum variance in the feature space. So when you project them back, you're going to find some kind of nonlinear shapes. OK? Can I ask you, why would you have using this VMA? <coughs> Don't you just be, like, if you have the XVM there, why are you only using the V? If you find the X sub M, do you have X? Sorry, this should be a is it the, the transport that's a transport the problem or or why are taking a generic X no, that's, that's yeah so that was just a typo it is it's a transpose okay and if you want it is just DJ transpose X okay I'm just looking at one uh, element of the projection thanks okay 
So what have we done so far? We just remember what is PCA, just from a, pro, you know, a computational a, a processing point of view, is on the one hand doing SVD and projecting on the first M eigenvectors, or you can just rewrite it, okay? And then you can, uh, on the one hand, exploit the fact, in the, of the, fact, you know, the fact that maybe either N or D, we, you know, that N could be much smaller than D, okay? So even in just in the linear case, maybe you wanna go this way just because N is much smaller than D. But if you go to actually, uh, and want to use high dimensional features or even infinite dimensional features and kernels, then this simple calculation we did, which again is just rewriting SVD, gives you a way to perform no linear dimensionality reduction. So I have a question about why you want to do SVD in your future space. So I think in a uh, linear set, in a linear case, uh, the reason why you want to do SVD is probably your dimension is too, too high, your DPA is too high, you want to decrease it. But in the, but when you are using kernel, you never face with the D directly. All you have is just a kernel matrix. Mm -hmm. So I don't say why it, the SVD can help you by decreasing the dimension of the, uh, of the, the data. So again, so there is an obvious, one thing, an obvious answer and a more subtle answer. Again, I took M much smaller than N and D. Yeah. So uh -huh. D is a million, N is a million, M is 10, okay? okay? After I did this calculation, I'm dealing with a matrix which is uh, a million by 10. Yeah. It's much more. But in a, but in a kernel, uh, in a kernel case, what you are having there is basically, because it seems you are also using kernel matrix and then dimension is n by n, so you are not Yeah, but the, so the, again, the, so let me say two things, okay? So one thing is, uh, which is getting to the point of this discussion. So the point of this discussion is, okay, PCA is the natural way of doing things and is the natural way to, um, so it's a natural, is a natural way to, to reduce dimensionality and you can use it. Once you have it, again, you can now deal with the matrix which is N by M. So after you've done PCA, you don't have to deal with the N by N matrix anymore or the N by D matrix. All you have to do is that you have to deal with a N by M matrix. Ready? After PCA, this is all you need to do, agree? So what we want to do now is to do two things. One is to see, okay, what happens if you just use it? And we'll see that somewhat PCA is particularly matched to the kind of learning algorithm we have seen so far. But then we want to question the fact that, okay, if you can do SVD and use it, then you have to deal with the small matrix. But to, to do SVD itself, you're going to pay a price because you have to deal with the big matrix, okay? So again, suppose for a minute that Sasha has a huge computer at Google and is going to do PCA for us. Then it's going to return us a matrix which is N by M. Do you agree? And then you have to use it. It's smaller than N by D and it's smaller than N by N. So whether you use kernels or not, it's smaller than whatever you could deal with before you did he did that for you. Do you agree? You're right. With kernels, you have to do with N by N, but N by N is going to be much bigger than N by M. Right? Again, a million times 10, a million times a million. It's not about the output dimension. It's about the fact that here you were dealing with a million by million matrix, and here I managed somehow to reduce the size of my data set. So basically, after uh, when you have the continuous kernel case, uh, your, your input will be a kernel, your output is still a kernel matrix with smaller dimension. After. Suppose that you want to deal with kernels. Uh, yeah. You have to solve a linear system where the system you're dealing with is n by n. Yeah. That's it. You agree? Yeah. Okay. Here I give you a way, which is gonna make an approximation, bypass that, and it's gonna deal with the new representation of the data. It's a more nonlinear representation of the data in a matrix is N by M, okay? So it's an approximation, it's not the full thing. I project on the first, I, I went in the future space and I project on the first M principal component in the future space. After PCA, again, he did it for free, okay? It means that rather than having to deal with this matrix, which is n by n, you only have to deal with this, which is n by m. So again, a million times 10 versus a million times a million. That's it. Uh, the, the, the procedure is sketched on the board. Again, the interpretation, if you want, is you go in the future space, and rather than work with the full kernel matrix, you somewhat project in an m-dimensional space, which is the span of the first m principal component in the future space. But here we're just taking, again, a more ad linear algebra point of view. We're not thinking about infinite dimension all that much. Make sense? Yes? Uh, is the kind of prediction of this matrix for the new x, it should be in the network with the old x matrix? 
I already did it. So he's asking about how do you project a new point? And here it is. This is a new point. This is not a point in the training set. This equation I, we wrote down here was for the training set. But here just holds for any point. So you can apply this for any point. And here you will just have the kernel between the new point and the point in the training set, as you just said. So yes. OK. So far, so good? <coughs> So this was a parenthesis about kernel. We just want to kill it. And again, we just did it because the next exercise in linear algebra is not about uh, that much about uh, kernel. It's very easy. So this is what is called kernel PCA. And it has a bunch of nice connection with stuff that people have been doing, for example, in uh, uh, using the idea of uh, the data may lie on a manifold. So using things like Laplacian eigenmaps, diffusion maps, the whole idea of exploiting differential geometry. Machine learning oftentimes lands from a computational point of view with things that look very much like kernel PCA for some specific kernels that gives rise to some more interpretation. All right, so what do we want to do now? Before we kill PCA and we say that we don't like it, we want to try to save it a bit more. And we just want to say, OK, what if what I do is I, I do PCA, either linear or nonlinear, OK? Doesn't matter. Let's stay linear for the sake of simplicity. And then once I have it, I have this matrix x. And now what I want to do is least squares. And again, we're going to mostly deal with least squares because it's simple and allows to do the calculation explicitly. OK? We just do least squares. OK? Then at this point, you just have to deal with this. And now we have that our w m is going to be equal to x m x m to the minus 1. And this stuff, OK? D the usual least squares estimator, OK? And, uh, and notice that I didn't write, uh, 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 I didn't put in the penalty, OK? I put lambda equal to 0. It turns out that we don't need lambda in this case. It's a, a, a particular nice case. So far, so good? So of course, making this calculation now cost me much less than dealing with the big matrix, OK? Either dealing with this or the other form where you let kernel pop out. Because here, everything you have to deal with is a matrix which has a size m that you can choose, and you can try to make her as small as you can before you uh, lose accuracy, OK? Or lose too much accuracy. So how big is this matrix? It would be m by m. And it's going to cost me m square this to build it. And this much to actually solve the corresponding linear system. And memory, well, you got essentially the biggest thing you have to deal with is this mn, OK? Again, I'm cheating a bit because now I'm hiding under the carpet the fact that I also have to compute the SVD beforehand. So I'm just, I'm just using Sasha one more time now. He's taking care of the SVD at Google, and then he just returned this matrix to me, and I use it. And see, I'm happy. Because now the computation went from the stuff that we typically have. You know, the, in, for example, in the kernel case, typically what you have to do is that you have to build the kernel matrix, which is going to cost you something n squared times the time of computing the kernel matrix. Then you have to take n in cube okay, to solve the linear system. And typically, you need something around n square memory to deal with a full kernel matrix. So again, this is back to your question. If x hat m is not the PCA, but the kernel PCA, this is the price of the algorithm. And this is the comparison with the original one. And so after PCA, I gain a lot. OK? Any question on this? Yes. Yeah, so we're sweeping under the rug two things. One that we're going to uncover in 15 seconds, and one that is going to take five minutes to uncover. The first thing is 
Okay, we are introducing some kind of approximation. Can we understand a bit better what kind of approximation we are doing? So this is basically an algorithm which is doing PCA plus ERM. Okay, so it's not just ERM, it's PCA plus ERM. So as he's saying, we are approximating something. How are we approximating? Can we make sense of that? And this is gonna, we're gonna do once the sound, this is creating some uh, suspense. We're gonna do now. <laughs> but the other question is, okay, Sasha was cheating. He doesn't have the computer. It doesn't work for Google. He's actually sitting right here with me. We uh, just have <laughs> crappy laptop, okay? So we're gonna write an N cube as big as the board everywhere here and say this was all a lie, okay? And we need to find a better way to do things. So that's gonna take the rest of the class to fix. So the first question is, what the hell are we doing here? What kind of a computation? Why did I not add the, the plus lambda? And here, basically, it just take a few seconds to show that if you let me, so let me write this down. And let me write, write the, so this vector is of size m. I actually want to see how it looks when I apply to any vector x to make a prediction. So I want to look at the face of f of mx, OK? If you do this, what you can see, so this, this uh, you know, requires a bit of a proof that you're going to do in due time. It's easy to see. It's really just another small linear algebra exercise that we're skipping now, that this particular vector here, when you apply to any x to compute the value of the function to do prediction, it's going to look like this. Again, what is this? This is just something we have seen already before. It's just a spectral form, the filtering form of uh, a linear predictor. For example, we saw that the case of Tikhonov was the case where we replaced this 1 over sigma with this. If you go back and when we did Tikhonov, we noticed that Tikhonov is just that thing, OK? Instead of the 1 over sigma j, j from 1 to m, is actually the sum from j to as many as you want. But then you do this kind of uh, reweighting. Similarly, we saw for, so this was Tikhonov. But we also see that for GD, you get something that looks like 1 minus 1 minus gamma sigma j t sigma to the minus 1. OK? So at the end of last class, I mentioned that you can just go in and write down the explicit form, and you see that. Yes? Uh, sorry, I have to do. Yes, you're right. <coughs> So it, it was complaining because I wrote x. You cannot do x, you're, you're right, because x is of size d, and this guy is of size m. You have to take the projected down version of x. OK, so let me call it xm. What is xm? <coughs> xm is just a vmx. Uh, what did I write? A vm, that sounds close. OK. So you take an x, you project it down, and then you compute the function. You just go in the projected space, OK? So this x is not, this xm is exactly this thing here. OK, now? This, this is correct. This x is x, OK? Is x because essentially, you, Again, this is, a, this is an exercise. We don't want to do it now. But you're essentially proving it in your head because it's simple, OK? You basically just write WM here, OK? You plug it in there. And in the end of the day, let me give you the spoiler. Why this is true is essentially because when you write XM transpose XM, OK, by definition, it's going to be VM By definition, it's just this, OK? And the thing is that this VM is just not any VM. It's exactly the basis of eigenvector of this matrix. So you're taking a matrix diagonalizing and projecting on the vector that diagonalizes it. And this is what makes life easy. Somewhat PCA is a projection that is married to the data matrix. So you can have this kind of nice forms, OK? And that's basically the main intuition of why this is true. Again, we want to skip this, because otherwise we spend 
two hours only doing linear algebra. But what you can see is that now you can answer the question you asked before. So what is the kind of approximation we're doing with the PCA? Well, PCA is uh, another way to do what Tikhonov does, ridge regression. Or another way to do what gradient descent did. It's just filtering out small eigenvalues. That was the whole story, right? When you see a small eigenvalues, you kill it. How? Well, here you don't weight it. Here you do a similar kind of weighting, where the weighting depends on the number of iteration. And here, you chop them with an ax. And M tells you how much you want to chop. Have you ever seen this method of solving least squares before? Does it have a name that you've seen before? I don't know. Hyperlog log? I was thinking more as truncated singular value decomposition, which is typically line two of the numerical linear algebra book. You take a linear, you know, you take a linear system, you diagonalize, you invert, and you only keep, don't only throw away the stuff that is zero, but only throw away some more stuff. So instead of the pseudo inverse, you consider a truncated decomposition. And then you invert the truncated decomposition. So in, uh, in numerical linear algebra, this is called TSVD. which stands for truncated singular value decomposition. In statistics, it also has a name. It's called principal component regression, OK? And if you want here, we're showing that this is just PCA plus CRM. So how much are you approximating things? Well, you're actually approximating things the same way you were approximating things when you replaced least squares with Tikhon of regularization. From an interpretation point of view, you gain something, which is now the fact that projection do regularization. Okay. In the case of PCA, dimensionality reduction as a preprocessing is already putting a form of regularization. Now, if you put everything together, you kind of get an interesting story because it basically says, OK, if you only consider this, but then you do optimization, and maybe before you do dimensionality reduction, you might want to pay a bit of attention because you might be exactly the same thing three times. If you do PCA, ridge regression, and gradient descent, you can actually say that you did Tikhonov, Tikhonov, and Tikhonov three times. And if you're, you know, if you're greedy enough to do PCA a bunch, you will never see any kind of overfitting because you already killed everything, OK? So you have three ways of controlling the potential stability and simplicity of your solution that are somewhat hidden in slightly more unusual devices. Optimization here, and now projection there. Yeah? No, so that's a good point. So the, the question he's asking is, it looks a bit like sparsity, because here, basically, I'm taking an expansion, and I'm taking away some terms. Okay, So I do have a basis, and then I'm killing some of the terms in expansion of this basis. That's correct. Okay. Now, sparsity, we're going to look, I think, next class, maybe. And it's the general terms of when you have a function that can be expanded on a particular basis, and some of the coefficients are 0. So clearly, here, I'm doing exactly that. Okay. The point is that sparsity is not uh, an absolute con concept. It's conditioned to a choice of a basis. So what is the basis I'm choosing here? PCA. Okay. So if you want, we didn't say it loud. But now we can see it even more clearly here. When you do Tikhonov ridge regression, gradient descent, or TSVD, principal component regression, in some sense, you're assuming that your solution is either sparse or close to sparse on a specific basis, which is the principal component basis. Okay. I say sparse or close to sparse because here I'm making really a sparse solution. And for this case, I'm only just depressing the coefficients. Okay. So if you want, this says that all these methods hold under as kind of a weak sparsity assumption, so a decay coefficient assumption, where the basis I'm choosing is PCA. When you do full-fledged sparsity, you say, OK, what if I don't want to take PCA? PCA is also very particular because it's the one basis that diagonalizes the data matrix. If you just take the canonical basis or any other basis you want, you're not going to have this nice property. Okay? But you're right. There is a hidden sparsity assumption here on the principal component. Sir, can we talk about uh, the standard errors in our W? Like what? The standard errors uh, in our estimates of W, whether it will go always go up or always go down. Of like this stuff? Yeah. Well, you're gonna you so yeah. notice that maybe I can ask you the question. So what was happening for ridge regression? If you change lambda, how do you expect the error to behave? I think the error will go 
Well, it depends if you have noise and if you have sampling, OK? So you're going to expect that you know, when lambda goes to 0, you're going to go to the pseudo inverse. But if the noise is a lot, maybe you want to take lambda different from 0. So typically, you assume that, again, you have the typically you expect to have like either you know, when you look at the, the training with respect to lambda is going to go down. You just fit the data. And then you can see that you can expect either to have some kind of very unstable behavior that kind of uh, when you have a um, lot of noise or sampling or maybe something more like you know, a plateau kind of situation where the solution just doesn't explode. Okay? So the answer to your question is a bias variance trade-off that we didn't quite discuss, but it's going to come up somehow later on. Okay? So you would regularize because you want to keep at bay the approximation on the one hand to control stability, but also you want to get a faithful uh, method to your data. And I give you the answer for Tikhonov because you just have to change the name of lambda into m now, or t for what matters, because they're all the same. Lambda, t, m are different names for the same thing. The main thing is the way you implement it computationally. So here, the idea is, if I let m grow very big, I'm just fitting my data. If I take m very small, I'm doing a lot of regularization. If I put lambda extremely big, I'm just doing a lot of regularization. If I put lambda very small, I'm basically just fitting your data. Okay. So the question about m, lambda, and t is the same. It's just a question about how you choose the complexity of your model to get the strike that But you want to look at the prediction with respect to the labels or to the outputs or just of the data? Just of the data, input data. It's going to go down for both. Yeah, because you're just, uh, you're projecting, yes, yeah. Yeah, again, yes, yeah. If you just, again, for the x's, you're talking about the x's alone. No x and y. So if you, for, what? He's talking about the, like, Right, and I'm answering to that question. Uh, all I'm saying is, if you look at the training error, okay, the training error, the error on your data in terms of supervised learning, the biggest is M. The bigger is M, the smaller is the error, okay? Because you're fitting more. Again, you're asking on the behavior of either this or its expected version, the one on a test set. So if you do access, then you can basically ask. Uh, so in the access, the behavior is the same. Okay. If you take the behavior on the data, it's going to be decreasing in the amount of projection you do. If you look at the separate set of inputs and you project, they're going to have the same behavior. Okay. The biggest is M, the more it goes down. Because again, you just there are some special properties. These things are somewhat contained and it's still going down. Okay. So it's for the output is a bit more interesting, but for the input it's just that. Yes. Not the exact time they're doing. Uh, um, so I, I don't think there are. So there are a lot of situations where we can prove that they're completely equivalent. There are situations where they're not completely equivalent, but they essentially have the same. Yeah. So there are essentially three different ways of inverting a matrix by killing small eigenvalues. And you can say, I'm going to make them to zero, or I'm going to make them small with this policy. In this sense, they're equivalent. So they're not exactly the same, but they are of the same form. No, right. So in practice, you know, as a practitioner, what you see is that you, you, you get essentially the same W, especially you get essentially the same WX. If you play with M, Lambda, you get typically the same thing, OK? So in practice, the answer is yes. Mathematically, in principle, they give you slightly different things, OK? Again, if you look at the kind of error they give you, they typically are equivalent, OK? Only constants are a bit different. Yes? Yeah. Or yeah. That's, uh, so w absolutely. So again, uh, uh, we're, we're going to do this kind of reasoning on Wednesday. So right now, we're just discovering that PCA 
is itself doing something like some form of sparsity. And we're just discovering that PCA was the basis. And this is just to discover that we basically talk about the same th thing three times, okay? PCA, gradient descent, and regression. That's where we stand. Of course, you can ask, what if I want to use other basis? Well, then you have to do sparsity. And then you have to do a one kind of regularization. Okay. Cool, this is the end of the story. So in some sense, this shows you in which sense the projection that you choose by doing PCA is somewhat nicely married to the ridge regression supervised kind of problem later on. Because already ridge regression has hidden inside the idea of using PCA. Again, unfortunately, the problem of all this story is that that there is, as I promised you here, a very big N cube. In fact, once you did the SVD, okay, or N, one of those, you have that thing cube. The size of the data set is cube, okay, because you need to compute the SVD. And Sasha was lying, and we had laptops, and the story before, okay? So really, you wanna, this is instructive, but uh, it doesn't solve our problem, because we discovered that it's really like ridge regression, both from a statistical and computational point of view. You end up paying the same kind of price. So can you do substantially better than this, okay? And I, again, you can complain, say, okay, but I'm a, you know, in numerical analysis, they told me that if I only want to compute the first M, uh, eigenvectors, I don't need to pay n cube, I could pay n square m. Sure, do that. You still have to pay a quadratic price in <coughs> time, but even more, our main concern is that you get that thing square in memory, okay? You have to compute, somewhat keep the whole thing, unless you go streaming somehow. So in some sense, we didn't really solve. You know, PCA itself is as hard as solving ridge regression or gradient descent. Our hope was to deal with memory. We didn't. We just didn't, OK? We learned that it's somewhat nice, but we didn't take much progress. So what we want to do now is to actually somewhat simplify this story. So we're still gonna keep we're still gonna keep this part of the story. But we're gonna change our matrix S, okay? And we need something that we can actually compute and apply fast. Any guess? If you have SVD, you're already get dead. Remember, if you say SVD, boom, you're dead. <laughs> you sample what? Right, so what you could do is to say, okay, I'm going to take x1 tilde, x1m, okay, contain in x1, x, and again, this guy is more than that. And then I'm gonna just take the matrix who's given by this, that is given by that. Okay, that's one choice. Any other offer? Random, okay, just random. You just take S, I, J, for example, Gaussian numbers, okay? Or something else. You can take either one, okay? In both cases, in one case, you have to take a bunch of random uh, entries and then read the data set and then extract. In the other case, you don't have to do that, but roughly speaking, this is uh, unless you are Yahoo, maybe something else, Google or Facebook, this is uh, not a big difference. So either one is fine, if you actually want to look at that. This kind of choice is typically what is called sketching, okay? And this is typically, for some reason, is very much related, of course. They're both random matrices of some kind. One is data dependent, the other one is not. But typically, you know, you find it if you look at keywords such as column subsampling or Nystrom methods, okay? But they're basically sitting in the same uh, sort of ideas. Okay, 
Now I have to be short. All right. So, so a bunch of things will be completely recycled from before, right? Because basically the idea here is, OK, once I have this reduced size matrix, I can just go in and do something like this, OK? The difference is that I'm still going to have these kind of costs, but I don't have these costs anymore. These are gone. They're just, just completely gone, because now I just created something quick, OK? So I'm happy. These are gone. So you remember when he said we're hiding some stuff, I said we're hiding two things. We're hiding the big N cube, and we're hiding this question, which is what kind of approximation we're doing. Here we go the reverse. Here we're not hiding the N cube. It's not there anymore. Okay? So we solved that big problem, but he can still have the same question as before. What kind of error we are introducing when we're doing this? Okay? Now, for PCA, it so happened that, again, when you were doing this, These happen to be exactly projecting a matrix on each eigenvectors. So it's very special. And so this gives rise to this nice connection with rate regression. Well, now if you just take, for example, let's consider first the second case, the sketching. You know, if it is just, just a case where S is a random matrix. And this is just not true anymore, OK? So in some sense, we're not sure anymore that the vectors that we choose to project our data are somewhat nicely aligned with the principal direction of the data. And since we are going to consider things like a transpose missing somewhere, which is uh, here, and uh, there is a bunch of hats. But the S for now, I'll just keep it. Uh, You want to substitute them here? This one? Here's this one. There you go. You're paying attention. You're very good. OK. So here, what you have is that you, you, you don't have this miracle. Before, we didn't have to add regularization or anything because PCA was already in the regularization the same way we did before. Here, there's no reason, real reason to expect that this is going to be true. Now, what you can observe is the following nice calculation, which is just if you, again, did the same trick we did before. So you take a point and you project it, OK? And then you multiply by, again, let me call x m the projection of x. So what I wrote here is x m transpose x m prime. Agree? I just plug in the definition. Now, what you see is that this is not, this is really changing some of the way you measure distances. But if you take the expectation, and then it's kind of nice. Because see, now I have this thing here. Now we have this. I can now move in the expectation in the inner product. get x transpose s s transpose x prime okay so i can push it in and this is essentially up to a constant proportional to x transpose x prime so the fact that i chose a, a, a gaussian an isotropic distribution something whose expectation is a, a proportional to uh, an identity somewhat give me some hope back that I'm just not messing things up, OK? So in expectation, my method is still somewhat preserving the way we measure, do we do inner products, norms, or distances. But if you now take any m, so if you take the expectation away, well, it's not true anymore that it's just projection of the first m eigenvectors, OK? So in fact, this is that one can prove that you can make this quantitative and see that you actually quantify exactly how much approximation this is inducing. But there is some extra approximation going on. 
And so in practice, this is not enough. You need, well, in practice, let's say in theory. In theory, what you see is that uh, you have an extra variance due to the random projection to pay, and so you need to add uh, a regularization parameter. Okay. So now you have two parameters to play with. Before, I meant is that we just had one parameter, m, for PCA, which is controlling complexity, time, and memory. Here we have to play with two parameters, lambda and m. Lambda controls somewhat statistics, and m controls both statistics and uh, the amount of memory we use and the amount of computation we do. OK? So the intuition is that we're going to need something more to actually do, uh, obtain a stable classifier, a stable uh, estimator. OK? But other than that, the idea is very simple, OK? The idea is just to use uh, some kind of uh, uh, random matrices that allows to do this. OK? Make sense? It's a, it's a simple idea, OK? You just take the data, you random projection down, you solve the problem, and then you discover that unlike PCA, you're messing around the eigen you know, the eigen decomposition of your projected data matrix, and so you have to still introduce some form of control through some further regularization, okay? That makes sense? Now, you have to choose the regulation parameter, but other than that, you now have a, a very computationally efficient algorithm. Of course, the question here is how big you can make M before you lose a lot of accuracy, and uh, from at this point, at least for least squares, you have a pretty good understanding, okay? And one can basically show that it can reduce M substantially without losing any accuracy in terms of test error, okay? Any questions about this? Again, it's a relatively short story when we set things up with respect to PCA because you're just replacing PCA with a random matrix and realizing that you're playing a bit more variance because of your uh, choice of a stochastic matrix. Yes. Are you um, saying that the, there are some um, jointly Gaussian uh, components of the columns or rows of the? There are some what? Jointly Gaussian, joint, jointly Gaussian distribution. No. Oh, otherwise, wh what are your expectations of S S T is? I would assume it's I don't think. I'm, I'm just. Blah, blah, blah. I, I assume this to just be Gaussian. I mean, you mean one jointly Gaussian? Joint yeah, yeah, I guess so. I guess I need jointly Gaussian to, to get the identity. You're right. I think I want the Gaussian vectors. Yes. Yeah. OK, so how do we go on from here? Well, one way to go on is to essentially say the following. What if, instead of, uh, again, so because I want to have time, let me just uh, focus on this rather than the data dependent one, okay, let me focus on the, on the sketching approach. Uh, the other approach is very, very similar. The question you want to ask now is can we go beyond uh, linear sketching, okay? So far what we did is we take a matrix and multiply by another matrix. But the thing you can ask is what if I consider another, you know, I consider something like this, okay? So. What is sigma here? Sigma is some function, say, from R to R. In this case, it acts uh, uh, component-wise on the vector obtained. Um, oh, sorry, I didn't do this. Okay, or component-wise on each entry of this uh, matrix. Okay. If you want to write it down, for this case, you would have that for any vector, you write this down, and this becomes just sum j from 1 to, oh, sorry, sum uh, s j x sigma s x plus 1, s n plus 2 z. OK? So I'm just basically saying, instead of just doing a linear projection, do a nonlinear projection. Or instead of applying a random matrix, apply a random matrix, and then take nonlinear uh, of uh, each of its entries. Make sense? All right. You could do that, right? What are we doing? W what is the kind of stuff we're doing? Again, from a computational point of view, uh, there's nothing to add. I mean, you're using that. You have W 
what you have is now that you have this, uh, if you let me call this XM, then you're gonna do, you're gonna compute WM according to those equations I wrote over there, okay? And then you can just use it, okay? You can just uh, apply to one of these uh, projected vector as before. Okay, so from a computational point of view, this is not very interesting. Well, it's actually could be interesting, but we already told the story. There's nothing to add, okay? But we can ask, okay, what are we doing? What, what, what kind of function are we looking at? I don't know, let's write them down. Do you recognize them? Sum j from one to m. Then I have w, so let me take this for, Wm hat j, which is just some coefficient. Then I have to write down the inner product between this and that. But this is just this thing here. Ever seen this? It's our beloved neural networks. It's a funny neural network. Now, forget about the fact that I computed the coefficient that way, okay? This is basically, consider now this just this for any vector v in Rm, consider these kind of functions, okay? It's a neural network. What is the, it's a, what you might call a one hidden layer neural network with m hidden units. What is a bit different from the usual way you deal with the neural network? The inside weights, the one inside of the nonlinearity, are not optimized. They're chosen at random. <laughs> which means that the only one that are left are the one outside the nonlinearity that you can solve by a convex problem, which is exactly what we did over there. So this is a kind of particular uh, neural network where the hidden units are not optimized but chosen in some kind of uh, uh, random way. Okay? Again, the story here could finish. <laughs> But we can ask, okay, do we have some kind of understanding of what kind of function classes we can actually build this way, okay? So again, this is not just any random network. This is not just any neural network. It's a neural network with random weights. And so you can ask questions, for example, such as, what if I let m go to infinity, okay? What if I take an infinite number of units, chosen uniformly at random or according to a Gaussian distribution? Can I characterize what kind of function classes uh, I obtain, and the spoiler is that the answer is yes. And essentially there will be function defined by a positive definite kernel. As long as you have this equation here. So there are many choices of nonlinearity and random vectors where we can prove something like this. There exists a positive definite kernel K such that Kxx prime is equal to the expectation <coughs> of so I, you take the <coughs> you take the nonlinear sketching of a vector, you take the nonlinear sketch of another vector and you multiply them, okay? But then you take the expectation. Now, it turns out that there are many, many choices for which what you're doing is just building a kernel that way, okay? Can you give me an example? Can you give me an example of a sigma and an sj that is gonna give you a kernel? Can you give me an example of sigma and s that is gonna give you the linear kernel? Yeah, that's what we just did, right? So we just did the case where you just take the identity, okay, and you take this to be uh, vectors such that essentially the covariance matrix of that S in expectation is the identity, and that's it, okay? All right, so we do have an example because we just did it. So the question is if you have something more interesting than the identity, okay? And it turns out that there are many, many, many kernels for which you have this, and in fact, for each kernel, you have potentially many possible choices. Okay, and we're gonna give you one which is so simple because you can do it in one line. And then you can get the 10, uh, 10 year best paper award, the NIPS, if you do this one calculation. You have to come up with it first though, you know, to, uh, 
I'm just going to do the and I need to look at it because uh, my problem with Fourier transform. All right, so the question is, can we come up with some choice of sigma and s that is going to give us a nonlinear kernel that we can make sense of? And guess what? It's going to be the, our example is going to be the Gaussian kernel, OK? So we're going to cheat. Rather than starting from here, we're going to start from the kernel, and we're going to derive the sigma and s, OK? So here how it goes. We make it simple. So we consider the case where the input space is R, not Rd, just to make life easy. Okay? And then I consider the kernel E to the minus x minus x prime gamma. Okay? Then we can just use essentially the Fourier transform and three properties of the Fourier transform. The inverse Fourier transform, the Fourier transform of a Gaussian is a, and the translation is a particularly nice thing because it's just a, uh, in Fourier domain, it's just a multiplication uh, by an exponential. Okay? So if you do this, essentially this means that you can, you can do the inverse Fourier transform. Okay, then you're going to do the translation. And then you have the Fourier transform of a Gaussian is a Gaussian. And there is some constant here that we don't care about. Okay? No, this is the inverse Fourier transform. Sorry, this is the did over W and this is your right. Okay? So this is the inverse Fourier transform of the shifted Gaussian. OK? If you does it make sense? Now you stare at this enough, and you see that uh, there is hidden expectations, no linearities, and random vectors. OK? Well, allow me to do this magic trick. Pretty good, right? Now they say in every talk you have to give a proof. Boom. What is this? Is an integral over that thing. OK, but what is this thing? What kind of distribution is that? Up to constant? It's a Gaussian distribution. So this is taking the expectation over w, where w is taken with respect to a Gaussian distribution. All right, so I can write this down, OK? Be your lazy and write here Gaussian. Now I have to, you have to tell me what I'm taking the expectation of. Okay, what is that? Well, it's a slightly annoying. Uh, so again, it's, this is fine. This is just the inner product. So the, with the Gaussian vectors, but the nonlinearity is in this case is a little bit more complicated. It's not just a simple. It's a complex nonlinearity. Okay, is the nonlinearity e to the omega x e to the omega x prime. Okay, The minus just come from when you deal with complex numbers, you have to take the conjugate. Okay, All right, it's complicated, but you can just go in and MATLAB and implement it. You just say, uh, I want to do the complex exponential. Okay, You have to take the real and the imaginary parts. In fact, here things can be simplified quite a bit. There is a lot of symmetry going on because you're dealing with, you're dealing with the Fourier transform, but of something which is symmetric and real. And actually, you can show that you can replace this with the following. So again, this is the proof, OK? It's finished. Here, if you sweat a bit more, and we'll see if you will sweat a bit more forced or not, uh, then you can also show that you can replace this with a cosine. Essentially, you don't need to carry around the, the real and the imaginary part. OK? Where G according to a Gauss, and B is uniform. Okay.
So the calculation is really just that simple. Going from the ex complex exponential to the cosine requires a bit of uh, um, you know, numerical manipulations, but there's nothing particularly interesting. But then this shows you exactly an example of what we wanted. There are examples of, you know, go back to our story. Forget about the calculation in a minute. If I take a one hidden layer neural network, where as my nonlinearity, I take a cosine, and I take the weights and the offset to be you know, sample according to a Gaussian and a uniform distribution, then basically the infinite network will correspond to just using a Gaussian kernel. So if you look in the literature, there is this famous paper from the beginning of the 90s that said there is an equivalent between Gaussian processes and neural networks. That's basically making this observation, okay? Not for the cosine. The cosine is a bit, uh, is not the usual choice of nonlinearity in neural networks. But turns out that you can put, for example, here the rectifier linear unit and do this calculation, or the sine and do this calculation. It will not be this. It will be some slightly different calculation, but you can do the same, okay? So I finish here. The main point is essentially that uh, um, you can go from linear sketching to linear sketching. From a computational point of view, there's nothing to discuss. From a modeling point of view, you can make a connection of what you're doing if you take the limit for a, lo a large number of uh, random features, if you want to take in the expectation. Because then, for no linear sketching, you can make a connection with kernels. In the case of Gaussian kernel, here it is, again. If you're happy with the complex exponential, it's finished. You can now play the same game using different nonlinearities. Now you can say, okay, this can be useful to understand the limit of large neural networks, but you can also view this as a way to approximate kernel methods. If you take a kernel that you don't like because it's gonna give you huge kernel matrices, find this kind of representation. And in that literature, this kind of nonlinear sketching are called random features, okay? So give me a kernel, I find this, I define a random feature, and then I use the sketched version. And I go from n cubic and n squared to down, okay? Right, I'm late, I'll take questions offline. <laughs>